So I thought I would continue along that path in spiritual growth and talk about a different spiritual growth today and, and speak through what it means when it comes to spiritual growth. Now, it's my understanding and what I see in the landscape of the global Christian movement, especially the United States movement, is that we have sort of got away from spiritual growth as being important. In other words, you know, we see the part about salvation. It's incredibly important, right? We want people to go to heaven. We want them to, to find Jesus. And so, we, you know, we have, the, we, we have a programs in place that people find Jesus, that they have salvation, that they're baptized. But often after baptism, often as they get there, there's almost this dearth of uh, information about how we must continue to grow spiritually that we don't stay stagnant in Christ in other words I believe that stagnation is is probably one of the ways that allows Christians to trip up in their spiritual walk more than anything else I classify stagnation as not reading your Bible as much, not fellowshipping as much, not speaking of Christ to others, not praying as much. Is that when we get in this comfort zone, this place where we don't want to sort of stretch ourselves and change ourselves, that if we get too stagnant, what happens is, is that we start to not rest in the assurances of Jesus Christ. And I would suggest if you look back in your life and if you look into those times that perhaps when you were sort of sliding along as a Christian, some of us would call that a time when we sort of feel, you know, worn down um, as a Christian. You know, there, there are these, at times it feels like low spots where you're not quite as excited about everything. That when you find those, that there is more potential at that time for you tripping up in something. That it seems like that we are then stumbling through the day instead of being able to walk through kingdom walk with our heads held high. Like we don't have the energy to move forward. Now I know this morning after rise service last night and then not being able to sleep as well as I'd like, when I got up this morning, I looked like death warmed over. I was stumbling, I thought, tripping over things as I was trying to get to my den so I could finish up um, preparing for today. And, and I will tell you that when we're, when we're sort, of, sort of backing away from this spiritual growth, it's a time when we allow ourselves to be susceptible to the wiles of the devil. So for me, it's one of the most important things that we can teach in this church. It's one of the most important things that we can promote in this church is that there is this joy, this kingdom walking, in this spiritual growth of our lives. And, you know, I think about how and what that means. So, like in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, uh, if you have your Bibles with us, we're going to do 2 Peter for just a second, but then we're going to go to Colossians after that. But 2 Peter 3.18 but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and forever. You see, when we are growing in the knowledge of Jesus Christ, when we're, when we're growing spiritually, part of what happens is, is that then the glory of Jesus Christ surrounds us. The glory, the value of Him continues to foster in us this ability to walk with Him. And so when we talk about spiritual growth, we're talking about recognizing the glory of God. And I would suggest to you when we're not paying attention to our growth and to our spiritual growth, that then there are times that we do not recognize the glory of God. And then we come to what are some of the symptoms of the lack of spiritual growth? I've already mentioned a couple of them. You know, one of them, though, I think that's important 
is I always hear this of people that maybe are struggling a little bit with their spiritual growth, is I don't know what to do. I don't know what God wants me to do. I'm not sure what I should be doing. You know, the, the term that we would use in seminary is discernment. And so I believe that when our spiritual growth is, is not 100%, we're not fully into our spiritual growth, that lack of discernment becomes a symptom of that. Another one is lack of faith. Now, so be careful because what I am saying here is, I want to make sure I'm clear on it, is that if you do not exercise your faith, you do not grow spiritually, you will not have the strength and faith when those times come that you truly need it. There are going to be times when you need to be strong in your faith. As we talked last night about what Jesus tells us, which is ask, seek, and knock, that there are going to be times in your life that you keep knocking and you feel like there's no answer. What does that require? A great faith. You know, if we went to Hebrews chapter 13, we would see this list of people that had great faith. Why did they have great faith? It's because they exercised great faith. Now, don't laugh at me about this, but um, some of you know that I am lifting in a gym with a younger man. And he is killing me. He is um, a lot younger, he, he's able to, he has more stamina when he's lifting, but I will tell you this, the more I exercise my muscles, the stronger I'm getting. And faith is like a muscle, that if we exercise it, it gets stronger. If we let it atrophy, it gets weaker. The less we use it, the less that we can um, rely on it when we really need it. And so part of the discussion of spiritual growth is, is not only knowing what we should be doing, knowing what the will of God is for us, but also exercising our faith to the point that when we truly need it, when it is needed beyond anything else, when it's like everything else, I don't know how to go forward, there's no way to go forward, faith, if it is strong enough, gets us through. And that then, those symptoms steal the promises of Jesus Christ to us. In other words, it almost is like they hide them. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. You understand what he is saying? He says, you can know, I'm the way. I'm the truth. You can know the truth. And whenever everything else fails, you can have faith in me. And so, you know, these are the symptoms. So the question is, that what biblically do we learn that can help us understand what it means to grow spiritually and what advantages we get when we grow spiritually? So if you've got your Bibles with you, our main text for today is Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Now, Paul is writing to the Colossians, but when he writes to the Colossians, it is more of an area, like when he writes to the Philippians, he's writing to Philippi. When he's writing to the Ephesians, he's writing to Ephesus. Now, other people get the letter, right? But he's writing to a specific city. Colossians, on the other hand, is more like an area. It'd be like northwest Indiana. That'd be what it'd be like saying. And so inside of that, there are other cities and groups and, and he'll mention a couple of them in this. Um, but it's important to understand that we're not just talking about a singular city that he's writing this epistle to. So it's Colossians chapter 2, verses 1 to 10. Do you have it? Do you have it? Okay. Colossians 2, 1 to 10. Hear the word. For I want you to know what a great conflict I have for you and those in Laodicea, and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh, that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, 
attaining to all riches of the full assurances of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both in the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in spirit, rejoicing to see you, your good order, and your steadfastness of your faith in Christ. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, not according to Christ. For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead of the body. Now hear this, verse 10. This is the verse we're going to work heavily in. And you are complete in him, who is the head of our principality and power. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that through your word that we can grow spiritually, that we can find discernment. Lord, we ask right now that you give us the ability to hear your word and to digest it and then place it into practice. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I think if I was summarizing what Paul was trying to say in this scripture, he is saying our, your, our unity, our assurances, our faith grew, grow ever stronger because Jesus completes us. Now complete is an interesting word and I always hesitate to try to pronounce Greek words. But I'm going to try to pronounce this one. And I'll, I'll probably be wrong, and Faye, you can tell me afterwards if I am or not. But um, I believe it's pronounced play-roo, play-roo. And it's probably close, but I probably butchered it a little bit. But that's the Greek word that was used for complete in this scripture. And what's interesting is, is that when we see the definition of it, I see spiritual growth in the definition of complete. Three stages of, com of spiritual growth. The three definitions are to be filled, to be fulfilled, and to be finished. So complete can mean to be filled. It can mean to be fulfilled. Or it could mean, as it says, complete or to be finished. So let's start with the word filled. How does that, how does that fit into our spiritual continuum of growth? What does that mean? So when we invite Jesus into our heart, he fills us with this living water. And what this living water does is that it, it satiates, it, it satisfies our thirst for things. But I believe it also does something else for us. I believe like it starts to wash out the consequences of sin. You say, well, as soon as Jesus forgives me, I, I'm forgiven, right? Absolutely. Let's make sure our theology is correct. When Jesus says, you are free, as the song said, you are free indeed. But there are still consequences inside of you. Not because of Jesus, but because of you. Like you can harbor unforgiveness. And this living water starts to wash through you and starts to break loose this unforgiveness that you're carrying inside of you. Right? I mean, so one of the things that happens when we are filled that as it starts to fill into every nook and cranny of us, it starts to remove any of those things that have been left over as residual effects of sin. And unforgiveness, let's make sure we, we recognize this, unforgiveness can be unforgiveness for others, but more than likely, a high percentage of the time, the residual effect of unforgiveness is unforgiveness for yourself. 
what God is going to do with the pouring in of this living water is start to remove, wash away those sticky points of unforgiveness that you can't get rid of on your own. So being filled allows you to, it, to fill you up in such a way and get every nook and cranny filled so unforgiveness can't reside in you no more. And our spiritual growth allows us to, if we accept that, allows us to start to get rid of the unforgiveness. And it is such a big part. The second area is that it starts to wash away any self-centeredness. If you've got self-centeredness in you, you've got to allow that living water to completely wash it away. And it is, it is an area that sometimes we don't even recognize on our own. And that God sometimes has to send us through something so that when we get on the other side, we understand that we really was, He was trying to help us understand that we are self-centered at some point. And thirdly, it helps wash away any unrighteousness that we have. Jesus forgive the thief. There was still unrighteousness that he had harbored probably inside of him that had to be washed out. This living water fills it up. And, and think of it this way in spiritual growth. Um, you got, some of you can nod your heads if you have experienced this. When you're first saved, there are still things in your life that are not righteous. And as you go and as you continue to grow spiritually, God starts to poke at those things and say, well, you know, that's really not how God really wants you to do it anymore. And he pokes at it, and he starts to wash, break it loose, and then the living water sort of washes it away, and then you grow from that, right? And, and so that's part of this filling, this being filled. In completeness, we can be filled with this living water. Second is fulfilled. Fulfilled is our second word, our second definition of complete. Fulfilling, when we are completed by Christ, we are rewarded with a joyful experience of walking in the light of Jesus. This fulfillment is a form of contentment. I would tell you that many people that I encounter that are not Christian, that though they don't recognize it, one of the biggest struggles they have is they are not content. They are not content with what they have. They're not content with where they are. They're not content with themselves. They're not content with their spouse. They're not content with their children. And it's because Jesus Christ is not in their life. He has not completed them to the point where they can feel contentment. Now, contentment, we have to make sure we divide correctly. Contentment is not lackadaisical. Okay? This is, you know, not sitting on the beach with an umbrella and a chair and just letting the day pass by. Contentment, we're not talking about laziness. We're not talking about you know, stagnation. We're not talking about being lackadaisical. We're talking about this contentment that we are satisfied because we are fulfilled. And it is such a danger on this contentment to make sure on what side we are that, we, that Jesus in Revelation chapter 3, he speaks to the same people that Paul was speaking at the beginning of his chapter to the Lacedonians. And he says to them, you know, you're neither hot nor you're cold. I wish you were one or the other. I wish you were hot or I wish you were cold, but you're neither. And then it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible, I guess because I'm immature, and it says that he vomits them out of his mouth. He vomits it out. He spews them out because, you know, and, and today I don't like cold coffee, but many of you like cold coffee. Many of you like hot coffee. Seldom does anybody like lukewarm coffee. Either give it to me cold, give it to me hot, don't give it to me lukewarm. 
And it, it is the same here. Contentment cannot be about being lackadaisical. Contentment cannot be that as we are growing that we just, oh, maybe I'll do something here, maybe, I'll, maybe I won't. You know, When we're talking about being fulfilled, being completed by Christ, we are talking about allowing Him to provide the contentment in our lives that we can rest upon Him in everything that we do. That we have that peace. Peace comes from hope. Peace comes from joy. You don't have peace if there's no hope. If there's no hope, there's no peace. If there's no joy, there's no peace. So the contentment is from it being fulfilling to us, being completed in Christ. Finally, we are finished in Christ. And I thought about, well, what's it mean to be finished? And I'm, I'm going to give you two examples. I hope they're, they're good examples to you. Um, the first is, a house is not a house if the roof and the walls are not done. A house has a purpose, right? We go into the house for security. We go into the house so that it doesn't rain on our heads. Go, we go into the house so that we have certain resources that we can sequester into a space so that we can do things. And so a house is not a house unless it is finished. I mean, if a builder came to you and said, you asked them to build a house and they hand you the key and there's no roof on the house, unless this is a weird design where there's no rain and snow, up here you would say, uh, you got some more work to do, right? You got more work up here to do. You know, there's no roof. I mean... You know, like today, it would be a pretty um, umbrella-type day in here if uh, we didn't have a roof, right? And, 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 you know, we are the house of God, and, and when we are finished, we need to have been finished by Christ in such a way that we are completely built, that we have the ability to do the things that He wants us to do. Our purpose is partially because He has finished us. Now, finish sounds like a stopping point. To me, this finished means that I have the ability to, to do what is purposed by God. You know, maybe your purpose is to be an encourager. It's difficult to be an encourager if you're not completed by Christ. If you're not finished by Christ. The second type of finish I almost played the video, but I was afraid for copyright things and, and some other reasons. The second type of finish is that in our military, before you do anything else, you go through six weeks of boot camp. Typically, though I've never experienced it, I've had friends that experienced it, and, and many of you in the audience have experienced it, you are not the same person that went into boot camp, that came out of boot camp. I think that's a typical statement for guys that have done it. I don't know if you can shake your head and say that's probably a good statement. But typically, we are not, you're not the same when you go in as when you go out. So when you are finished in boot camp, you are prepared for something. Well, there's this video by the Marines that talks about, and I found it so apropos to Christians, is that how... When chaos is heard, that very few want to run to chaos. Very few want to be a solution to chaos in the world. And, and, and for me, it, it struck me so, wow, isn't that really what we are as Christians? Is that when we say chaos in people's life, in our community, in our world, we should be willing to be, to run toward the chaos. And part of us being finished Go, and being spiritually where we have grown enough to do that is that when we are strong enough, we then can go out and we can run toward the chaos. You see, it's not natural to run toward chaos. It's not natural to run toward those things that are difficult. But as a church, we have to be strong enough. We have to be brave enough. We have to be bold enough 
that when we see chaos, that we bring the armor of God with us, the Word of God, the breastplate of righteousness, the truth of Jesus Christ, the helm of salvation, the peace. All these things we bring to the Gospel because we in spiritual growth are going through a spiritual boot camp. When you do this military boot camp, they are preparing you physically, emotionally, and mentally. I would suggest part of what the finished is in spiritual growth is God is preparing you physically. Sometimes He has to make you physically stronger, prepare you so that you can do the things that need to be done. And then He prepares you mentally. He prepares your soul to be able to interact with others, to be brave enough, courageous enough, and in this mythical spiritual boot camp and spiritual growth, He then strengthens you spiritually to the point that when you speak the truth to others, that you are speaking His truth, His way, His love. And it is the only way that we can truly express love God, love thy neighbor, is through as we spiritually grow, the change in us signals to others that we are modeling Jesus Christ. What I find so amazing when you start to talk about that we are filled, fulfilled, and finished by God, by Jesus Christ, is that He does not expect us to do this on our own. It is not you that must fill you. It is Jesus Christ. It is not you that must fulfill you because if you fulfill yourself, or if you try to fill yourself, you're going to fill yourself with things that are not holy, that are not righteous to God. If you allow Christ to fill you, if you allow Christ to fulfill you and nothing else, then you can be strong enough that then you can be finished so that you can run toward the chaos, that you can run and help those that need help. The end of that commercial it has this last statement that flashes over a black screen. And it says, are you willing to run forward? And I think it's a great question when we talk about Christian spiritual growth. Is are you willing to continue to run forward? Or have you found a place that looks pretty comfortable and that you're content with? You may say, well, you know, it's hard to keep moving. But what they are saying nowadays in health uh, arenas and, and physical therapy and everything else, the key to health is to keep moving. I will tell you, the key to spiritual health is to keep moving, to keep growing, to keep feeding yourself the healthy food of the Bible, to feed yourself with the fellowship of other Christians. And then to exercise that in your faith and strength and boldness as you run toward those that need you. Right outside these windows, outside these doors, all around us, the world is in chaos. Inside your own homes, they may be chaos. Our country, no matter what your political beliefs are, is in chaos. This world is in chaos. The only solution this world, this country, your family, this community has is Jesus Christ completing us and us allowing Him to move us forward in our spiritual growth so that we can speak the truth to others. I'm not going to ask, are you going to run forward? But as you stand, I'm going to ask you this question as we close. So please stand.
have a very